Okay, well, it's 4.01 p.m. Uh, West Coast time, and I think it's uh, time that we get this uh, show on the road. So welcome, everybody, for being here. Just a couple of quick quick administrative notes before we get started. If you could uh, mute your microphone, of course, uh, we're, and uh, we're recording this program, and we will be uploading it to our YouTube channel at PNRA at some point here in the future. Uh, we have our special guest, Victor Hand, here. And I also have Robert Scott, uh, who partners with me on a lot of these events. Uh, I want everybody, if you've got, if you, you're so inclined, to just say hi in the uh, chat. And if you've got any questions in the chat, uh, or if you have any questions for Victor, shall we say, then the best way to do that is to put those questions into the chat. And at the end of the program, uh, Robert will be monitoring those questions, and then we'll have uh, some questions and answers for. For Victor Hand. So I think we've got a really exciting program here. And um, I'm just going to give it a pause for a second, and then we're going to start. The Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive and Cascade Rail Foundation welcome you to today's presentation by world famous photographer Victor Hand. The Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive is in Burien, Washington, near the Seattle Tacoma International Airport. We are a consortium of railroad heritage organizations dedicated to the preservation and sharing of railroad history from the greater Pacific Northwest. Cascade Rail Foundation is a member of PNRA. CRF is the Western home of the Milwaukee Road Archives and is actively involved in the preservation of Milwaukee Road legacy in Washington State, including the Palouse to Cascades Trail and the South Clay Elm Heritage Site. Today, we have the pleasure of enjoying images from the Pacific Northwest, selected by Victor Hand. Victor shares these images of a variety of railroads, including my favorite, the Milwaukee Road. And we'll end the program with a few intriguing programs from, well, shall I say, for now, elsewhere in the world. Victor Hand was born and raised in New York City, where he attended college and law school at New York University. He became interested in railroads at an early age and took his first railway photograph in 1955. His pursuit of railroad photography has taken him to 53 countries. Victor enjoyed a 35-year career in the railroad industry, starting as a fireman with the New York Central Railroad and ending as a management consultant specializing in railroad operations and facility planning. There you go. He has authored several books of railroad photography and has contributed his photographs to dozens of books by other authors. Hundreds of his images have been published in a rainbow of railway periodicals that literally span the globe. His collection is preserved for our continuing enjoyment at the Center for Railroad Photography and Art in Madison, Wisconsin. A special thanks to CRPA, Scott Lotus and your entire team for your facilitation of this presentation. What a pleasure it is to work with you folks. Um, I just also wanna say that along with, with me, Jonathan Fisher is your host. I also have Robert Scott. Robert's gonna be moderating our chat and, uh, and you know, just kind of generally keeping an eye on things. And, and Robert is involved with the virtual rail fan camera in Chehalis, Washington. So that's a 24 hour live stream camera with a chat function. So if you're, you know, wanting to watch trains at some point in time, you know, that's a, a good way to do it. Now, funding for tonight's event is made possible by supporters like us supporting our local community organizations and by For Culture, a funding agency for culture, heritage, and the arts in King County, Washington. Now, please join with me. And welcoming Victor Hand. Hello, Victor. How are you? Very good, thank you. Good. How are how is life in uh, Bar Harbor, Maine these days? It's cold. Cold. Now, do you have lots of snow? A little bit. Yeah, it's supposed to get more tomorrow. I think. Oh, you are okay. All right. Now, have you been traveling anywhere? Do you have any big travel plans? Well, yeah, I'm starting again. I got knocked off for a couple of years, but I'm I'm going on a few trips this year. Okay. Well, I'm sure that we'll be looking forward to seeing your accomplishments from the future. Today, we're going to look at some Northwest Railroad photography by you. And I just wanted to mention that this cover photo is by Jeff Nast, N-A-S-T. So, Victor, let, what's with that? Nast with an N. Yes, N-A-S-T, I think, oh, right? Nast. 
mast with an M. Oh, M. I'm sorry. M-A-S-T. Yes. So, thank you. I, you know, well, might as well get my facts straight. So let's start out our presentation with a trip down the Oregon trunk. Oh, hang on here. There we go. There. Okay. Take it away. Okay. Uh, my first trip to the Pacific Northwest was in the late 50s with my parents. Uh, we rode the Canadian Pacific from Montreal to Medicine Hat and then a bud car to Lethbridge to visit some friends. Uh, from there, we went over to Banff and Lake Louise. Uh, I remember seeing steam engines in Winnipeg on the way out there. And there was a coal mine in Canmore, Alberta that had some steam engines. I, I remember the spectacular scenery and filed that away in my head for future years. Uh, my first photographic trip to the Pacific Northwest was in 1972. I had seen a lot of photos by the great photographers like Hale and McGee and others. And I went to the Columbia Gorge and then the Deschutes Canyon. Uh, my wife came along on this trip and we were both foodies. So I enticed her with promises of salmon. But uh, it was a long time of year. Only the Native Americans were able to catch salmon at that time. So she lost out. Uh, this first picture is the day we went into the Deschutes Canyon. It was July and hot. Uh, my wife almost died and said to me, do it by yourself from now on. Uh, I've done that for over 50 years. Uh, this is an interesting picture. It's a couple of years after the Burlington Northern merger and it dates from 1972. And uh, it has four locomotives from all four of the predecessor railroads of the Burlington Northern on the same train. Uh, next image, please, Jonathan. Yes, sir. There you go. Uh, we'll look at some pictures I've taken of the Burlington Northern in the Pacific Northwest over the years. Uh, we'll start with we'll start with Burlington Northern and get onto other roads later. Uh, this is a uh, freight train crossing the Columbia River, coming into Wishram, Washington. Dates also uh, from 1986. Uh, it was a pretty nice spot at Wishram with this bridge over the Columbia River. Uh, next image, please. Uh, here's a train leaving Wishram. Uh, also crossing that same bridge, uh, going towards the Oregon trunk. Uh, this dates from 1979. Um, next, please. Uh, this is an eastbound uh, grain train at Mary Hill, Washington, just east of Wishram. Uh, you can see the old roadbed down below there, the railroad had to be raised a few times as they built dams along the Columbia River. So there's quite a bit of uh, interesting uh, earthworks out there. Um, so Victor, I just have a quick question. Um, now I noticed the previous image was color and this one's black and white. Um, how do you decide when to do which? At the last minute, I, I take a look at what's going on and I can throw a sheet of color in any time, takes a second. So uh, sometimes I'll have two film holes sitting in my pocket and I can just grab the one I want. I don't do that much color, 5% uh, maybe. Now, when you say sheet holders, what kind of camera are you using? Uh, that picture that you had of me on the front shows a speed graphic four by five inch and it takes sheet film. Uh, the, a film holder holds two sheets of film, one on either side. And, and you've, and how many years have you used that camera? Bought, I first went to 4x5 in 1962, and uh, I've been with the same cameras and lenses ever since. Yeah, fantastic. You ready for the next image? I am. Uh, this is Lyle, Washington, 1972, uh, eastbound train. Notice that the uh, water level is low. There's a line along the bank there. Uh, for some reason, it must have been dry that year. Next, please. Oop, hang on here. Come on. I've got a, I'm stuck for a second. So there we go. Here's another shot in the same place at Lyle. This is 1979 and you can see the water levels up a bit. Uh, colors look very nice in that shot. Now you're kind of dangling off a cliff here, aren't you, Victor? No, you're just kind of standing there. That's oh, the, okay. And this yeah. is a- uh, As I've gotten older, I've learned not to stand too close to the edge. <laughs> I think we should all take some uh, advice from that, shouldn't we? So here, let's look at the next one. Yeah, uh, this is at uh, Goodnow, Washington, 1979, eastbound freight train. Uh, what I remembered about this shot was that there are ingots of aluminum 
on those bulkhead flats because there used to be a, an aluminum uh, smelter in this part of the world, but that technology, that industry is long gone now. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, out of Lyle, Washington, there was a branch to Clickitat. There was a, a lumber mill up there, I guess, and they produced lumber and chips. Um, I caught the local one day. It was down in Lyle and saw the local there, so I went up and got this shot. Uh, next case. So, so you had a little bit of luck on this one? Well, no, you just, whatever you see, you, you know. Okay. Whatever, whatever you run into is what you get. <laughs> there you go. Okay, well, let's see what we get next. Uh, this is uh, Burlington Northern local freight going down uh, joint operation of the Union Pacific and the Northern Pacific, which went to Lewiston, Washington, connected with the Camas Prairie Road, which is also a joint operation. The background here is uh, Union Pacific's Joso Bridge over the Snake River. Okay, next image, please. Uh, East of Wenatchee on the former Great Northern uh, it was a very interesting bridge. It had been strengthened years ago by doubling the girders. They just built a bridge within a bridge. Uh, and I like this bridge very much. Took the trouble to walk to both ends of it over the years. Uh, it's quite a, quite a walk either way. Uh, this is an eastbound freight in 1986 crossing the Columbia River. Yeah, that is quite a walk to get in there. So Rock Island, Washington. Rock Island, Washington. There you yeah. go. Okay. Next, next case. The Deschutes Canyon uh, caught my attention. That's a spectacular piece of railroad. Uh, here's a Northern Pacific engine in 1972 at Shirar's Bridge. Uh, it's southbound train. It's always good stuff. In the... Yeah, that's a little bit of a tricky spot to get to. I don't think we would be trying that at our age anymore, would we? Well, uh, yeah, I was a lot younger then. <laughs> yeah. What okay. year was this, Victor, did you say? 72. 72. Wow. Right after the merger. Look at that. Uh, Northern Pacific SD45 and SPNS Alco. What a neat concept. Okay, next. Uh, this is a scene in Portland uh, of the former roundhouse. Uh, just uh, the turntable was still there. Yards were still in use. Grain elevators. It's a nice scene. Wow, it's a beautiful scene. Is this Hoyt Street? I don't know the street, but it, I'll, uh, I'll put it in. Someone will answer us in the chat. We'll find out. Yeah, so it, it was a roundhouse there at one point, but yeah. it's right, right in downtown Portland. Right in downtown Portland. It's a neat shot. Yeah. So were you up on top of something? Uh, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it looked like it. <laughs> I, I didn't have a drone in those days. <laughs> and you still don't, do you? Well, no, I had I had a drone. It was called a helicopter, but I didn't oh. use that too often because it was expensive. <laughs> ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle was a terrific line. I really liked. I really liked it at uh, Wish Ram. Uh, this is a eastbound train leaving Wish Ram with uh, a Great Northern unit on the back and two Burlingtons and a couple more Great Northerns. Next west. Uh, next. Next picture, please. Uh, after the Frisco people took over Burlington Northern in the early 80s, they made some, what I consider some really bad decisions. One of them was abandoning the SPNS between uh, Spokane and Pasco. It, it was a good line, well engineered. And as traffic has grown in recent years, they probably wish they had it back because they've had to pour a lot of money into the parallel Northern Pacific line to upgrade it and expand its capacity. Uh, this is a, a grain train at a place called Burr Canyon, Washington, along the Snake River on one of the big trestles on the Spokane, Portland, Seattle. Yeah, the uh, Union Pacific can be seen on the other side of the river. Uh, high up on the hill, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Next. Uh, this is a uh, Portland Galesburg train uh, coming up out of the Snake River Canyon at a place called Devil's Canyon, Washington. This dates from 1979. Now, this isn't a typical direction for them to run, is it? No, they ran, ran mostly westbounds on that line, but they, they ran an eastbound now and then. For some reason, this came that way. Okay. Well, yeah. Lucky you. It's a great shot. Ready? Okay. Next year. Uh, they resurrected uh, the SPNS 700. Uh, uh, in the 90s, and I liked that engine. It ran a 
couple of excursions on its home territory where it belonged and looked very good. Uh, here it is on a Vancouver to um, Pasco trip. Uh, the train was actually going to Spokane. It was a, it was a long weekend. Uh, this is a Goodnow, Washington, 2001. Next. Uh, here it's coming back on that same trip. Uh, pan shot at Koki, Washington. Yeah, that's a great shot. Now, and it was moving? You, this was an action shot? Oh, yeah, of course. Look at the smoke. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Ready? Yep. Well, there's some action. Yeah, this is pretty good action. This is uh, at Mary Hill leaving uh, Wishram going east. And big, long train, a couple of domes in it. Very nice trip it was. It's got a water car, but no diesel. Yeah, well, they didn't need a diesel. But the water car wasn't too objectionable. It looked, you know, it was kind of smooth. It wasn't like the Union Pacific ones these days. Right, uh, exactly, yeah. So, no, that's a nice looking train. And, and you said, where was this? Uh, Mary Hill. Mary Hill, yeah, okay. Got it. Yeah. Ready? Next. Uh, one time uh, after they did some work on the 700, they wanted to test it out. So they, they took it over to uh, uh, Portland Western line uh, going up uh, Cornelius Pass. And they tested it and ran, ran it one day. There were only a couple of people around. Uh, we had three or four of us. And boy, it was a, it was a pretty good day. Uh, this is one shot so you, of it. You were in Portland for business and then you just kind of oh, came across yeah. this or? No, I was out there. I, I think I knew about it. Uh, my, my friend Dave Goodhart uh, kept in touch with people all the time, and he he was he was before the internet. He was my source. Ah, okay. So there wasn't too much that was happening that we didn't know about. So then, was Dave with? You? Obviously, Dave would have been with you on this trip, oh, yeah. right? Of course, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else you remember or not? And Nils Huxtable showed up. I remember. Oh, Nils. Oh, I knew he'd had to make an appearance here somewhere. Yeah, so. he he has good sources also. Okay. okay. Ready? Next. Yep. Here we go. Uh, same day, same engine. Same. Oh, look at that smoke. That's just beautiful. Same spectacular scene. So they ran a little, what, did they run like a little freight or a little passenger? Yeah, 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 they were just testing the thing out. They wanted to see, make sure that whatever repairs they had done were, were working right. And this was an easy place to do it. I, I would uh, say from this picture that the work repairs turned out okay, huh? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They were based at place called Linton, Washington. I remember there was a, a nude bar there where we spent time in between in between runs. Um, okay, next case. Yeah, this is a night shot at Linton there. Uh, wow, that's quite nice. Who do you remember did the lighting? I do. I do all that. Oh, you do? Oh, okay. I uh, Early on in my career, I discovered a book called Night Trick in the Norfolk and Western by O. Winston Link. Oh, sure. And then I saw Jim Shaughnessy's night photographs in St. Albans, Vermont. And I said, I want to learn how to do that. Well, yeah. a guy uh, that I knew when I was younger, Bud Rothar, showed me how to do it. And uh, I've done an awful lot of night photography over the years. Some of the best pictures are taken at night or in the snow. And the best of the best are taken at night in the snow. Oh, okay. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, this is a fantastic shot. This is just great. Ready yes. for the next one, Vic? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, one time uh, they dressed 700 up as Northern Pacific engine. <laughs> it changed the number and a couple of details on it. And it looked pretty good that way also. I just was lucky enough to be around when that happened. I so guess. what year was this and where is this? Uh, that's in Portland, 1992. Portland, 1992. And and then did it? Did they run it very well, far or they just do it for uh, publicity? No, they, they just had it out there uh, at the Brooklyn Yard where they kept the thing in those days, SB's Yard. And yeah. I don't think it was anywhere. I think they just did it for fun. Uh, anyway, oh. that, that was in 92 when it first came out. Uh, those pictures in Cornelius Pass were from 98. And of okay. course, the trip to Pasco was, uh, uh, to Spokane was in 2001. And I don't know, if, right. it's, I don't know if it's run very much since. I don't think so. Yeah. Let, let's look at another image. Okay. Sure. Let's go to the Burlington Northern Years. Uh, yeah. Which, of course, is after, uh, when when did Berlin? Well, no, well BNF, I don't know. BNF, 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 BNF was 1996, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Anyway, this is a, a piggyback west Chicago-Portland train at, at a place everybody knows, uh, Horse, Horse Thief Lake, uh, 2006. Pretty nice stuff along the Columbia River. 
So Victor, I've got a question for you here. Now, shooting the camera that you shoot, you don't have a motor drive. So no. how do you, I mean, how do you do it? I mean, this one is crack. like perfectly framed. How do you do it? You get one crack and you pre-visualize it. Uh, if okay. there's, like you notice that telephone pole is straight. Yeah. Uh, I can raise the front and, and get rid of tilting buildings. And, and then anyway, I, I set up and I say, I, here's what I want to do. Here's where I want the engine to be. And that's when I shoot because I only get one crack at each train. Right. Now, do you use a tripod then generally? No, most of the time not. I, I if I'm your night shots, you need it, of course. And yes. uh, if sometimes I'll use a tripod if I'm using two cameras. If I want to shoot both color and black and white, I'll put one on the tripod and handhold the other. Uh, I also have a rig where I can put two speed graphics on it, but the thing weighs about forty pounds and it's really <laughs> pain in the neck. Yeah, uh, I don't use it too much. Okay, let's look at the next image. Okay, this is an oil train at place called Yulapit, which is a beautiful spot, but hard to get to. It's uh, east of Pasco, uh, excuse me, west of Pasco. Uh, east of Plymouth, I believe, isn't it like down on some dead end dirt road? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, and then there's no, I didn't have decent maps and man, man, I got lost getting in there, but we found the place a couple of times. Uh, anyway, Back in the day when we had to use maps and we don't use GPS on our phones, right? Well, I don't do that. I still use, I still know how to read a map. Uh, this is a yellow in 2016. Okay, uh, that's a great action. shot. Okay. Now, how uh, this, did you get this one? This is also at your lap, uh, uh, in, also in 2016. I took my wife on a cruise uh, on the Colombian Snake Rivers. And uh, one day, everybody got off to go to some winery or something. And I said, no, we're going to go up through the narrows there today. I'm going to stay on the boat. And uh, sure enough, a couple of trains came through while we were going through that territory. And uh, this is one of the results. Uh, oh, that's happy. that's good timing. You know, you got the train perfectly framed in the picture and your, your boat was close enough to capture everything. The, the, the light at that going, time of day was perfect. The boat was going slow and the train was moving faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, was, it, was well, it looks, like, looks like what, maybe a, a mid after early after lunchtime eastbound, maybe? Yeah, yeah mid, midday, midday. Yeah, midday eastbound. Okay, all right. Here we go to the next image. Okay, here's a well-known spot near Lyle uh, on the river. This this is from 2016 also. Uh, yeah, you could dangle and knock those cliffs again, Victor. No, I'm not too close. Don't worry. Okay, all right. I remember scaring the hell out of my father once on the Lehigh Valley, and uh, he yelled at me about that, so I was careful after that. Well, what uh, happened so, there? Well, I got too close, and he was worried I was going to go over. Uh, oh, okay. Same well, you live. Same kind of place, but it was in Pennsylvania, not in Oregon or Washington. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next one. Here's that fancy bridge again. Uh, this is a westbound train, a uh, place called Alcoa Spur, also a long walk to get to, but it's, it's worth the trouble. This is 2013. Yeah, that is a long hike back to that bridge. Wow. Okay, cool. And 2013 and a westbound train, it looks like maybe late morning? Uh, yeah, late morning, double stacks. Yeah. 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 Lovely. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Okay, when you get uh, east of Wenatchee, the former Great Northern climbs up out of the Columbia River Valley, pretty pretty good climb up to a place called Trinidad. And then it goes around a big loop at Crater. Uh, go to the next one, I'll show you Crater. Oh. Uh, crater kind of looks like the backside of the moon. It's actually a vol volcanic place, all lava rock and a couple of tunnels in there. Uh, also a very nice place. Uh, Another double stack. This one's going west. Uh, yeah, there's. A, they've kind of like relocated the track back there a couple times, haven't they? I think so. Yeah, there's a bunch of bunch of different places you can drive in. On yeah, and I think you drive in on the old right away part of it. So yeah, yeah this is a great shot. Looks yeah. like uh, early afternoon, I would say. Right. This is 2010. 2010. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is. Uh, place called Voltage, Washington, below the Rock Island Dam. The Rock Island Dam, I think, is the last hydroelectric dam on the Columbia. And then the big Alcoa plant near it there. Uh, yeah, the Alcoa plant would be off to the left up on the hill. Correct. Uh, yes. So in uh, color in this case, now, you know, this is a great northern publicity shot. Well, I've uh, never seen it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this is a GN publicity shot here. So 
a lovely uh, train with the rock formations and the dam in the background. Yeah, very nice. Well, this is 2018. 2018. Okay, here we go. Okay, the uh, former Northern Pacific mainline through the Yakima Canyon was taken out of service, uh, abandoned by BN, but it was put back in service for uh, basically to relieve congestion on the uh, SPNS and the Great Northern. They use it mostly for eastbound empty trains now. Uh, here's a grain empty east of Rosa, Washington, 2009. And here's the next one. Yeah, Providence Hill. Uh, this is the former Northern Pacific Main Line from Spokane to Pasco, uh, which got very busy after they abandoned the Spokane Port in Seattle. So they've had to double track a lot of it and make a lot of improvements. Um, so, Victor, but I have a question about this. Now, I've been there and I've taken pictures and they don't turn out as well. What is it about the light or what you do that creates such a, a compelling composition? Well, I don't know why yours aren't any good. They should be. <laughs> well, I mean, I you know, I I they should be too. But I mean, this is just. I mean, how do you? Is it the light or what is it? That... Yeah, look, yeah, you you're, you're watching the light, and you got to pre-visualize. You know, you got you're looking for distracting things you don't want in the pictures. People, uh, dogs, cows. Yeah, I don't like people very much, and I don't like cows are okay. My daughter likes cows. Well, that's right. We we got a cow picture coming. Uh, spoiler the, alert. The uh, clouds make this one nice. Course, yeah, the, when there are clouds like that, of course, you get wiped out sometimes. Everybody knows the problem. Okay, next case. Uh, here's an eastbound train, also on Providence Hill. Uh, this one is 2001. Yeah, you're you're not afraid to go out there tromping around. Yeah, this is not a very easy spot to get to either. Yeah, well, you just drive around till you find spots, and sometimes you walk. If you some, sometimes. I'll have seen a picture that somebody else had taken and I'll go hunting for it. But most oh, of it, okay. you, just, you just explore and find stuff yourself. Yeah, right. I mean, you see something, it inspires you, and then you go find something that satisfies your photographic desire. So here we go to the next one. Okay. This Northern Pacific line is grain country. And uh, this is a you know, piggyback westbound in Ritzville, Washington, passing the big grain elevator at 2009. Yeah, the lighting is nice. Now, um, how is it that you get the locomotive to stand out like that from the grain elevator? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about that ahead of time. You, Are you? Okay. You, if you've got a dark front end on an engine, you want something light behind it. Uh, with a steam engine, sometimes you get steam, but with the diesel, you got to find something else. Uh, there's nothing worse than a dark front end against the dark background of trees. So I try and avoid that. Anyway, this this was a pretty good composition with this grain elevator, so I liked it. Oh, yeah, and I like the grain elevators behind it and the light and the shadows and uh, looks yeah. to be um, mid to late morning, I'm guessing, yeah. right? Midday, yeah, 2009. 2009. Um, Here we go to the next shot. Okay. That's another set of grain elevators, old ones. This is at Cunningham, Washington, 2016. There used to be a town here of almost 500 people, and there's you know nothing but a few shacks left at this point. A lot of places like that. Yeah. Well, I know. So okay. yeah. uh, let's Looks go like... to the Union, let's go to the Union Pacific side of the Columbia River now. It's Here we go. Pretty nice. Also, um, it was a little more difficult to photograph there because you had that freeway uh, and uh, it limited access, and got in the way sometimes. But you could do some pretty good pictures there. Uh, this is a uh, westbound mixed freight at Hepner, Oregon. Those boxcars are carrying probably grain. They, oh, they okay. Moved, they moved a lot of grain in those days in boxcars before before the covered hoppers really came into use. This dates from 79. 79. Okay, 1979. Okay, ready? Next. Uh, here's Union Pacific's Oregon Trunk Local, uh, UP. Uh, started building their own line down there, but they eventually made a deal with the Great Northern and uh, Spokane, Portland, Seattle, and, and used the same railroad. But they run to this day, they run a local down there. It comes out of the Dales. And here it is approaching the uh, Burlington Northern's Columbia River Bridge at uh, Oregon Trunk Junction, also 1979. So the Union Pacific track, which is underneath the BN Bridge, this train is coming up a connector and then will connect into this track that's coming across the bridge. Correct. The Union Pacific main line is below, uh, below that girder bridge, and this is a connecting track to the Oregon Trunk. Right. Okay. Ready? Ready. Uh, this is at Miller, Oregon, a couple of miles from the last shot, and you can see the uh, 
the Oregon trunk climbing the, on the hill coming out of the tunnel. That train is west uh, eastbound on the Union Pacific Main Line. Yeah, and I noticed that you've got our friend the freeway just to the edge of the picture. So you must have parked on the freeway and then jumped over the guardrail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't like stopping on the freeway, but sometimes I do it. Um, yeah, well, this would be worth stopping for, I think. So next. 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 Uh, this is crossing the John Day River, a place called Day, Oregon, eastbound train, Portland Hinkle. Yeah, another nice shot. Uh, again, you've a challenge with this freeway, but a great time of day. So this would be like late morning, do you think? Oh, uh, probably, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. And you can see one of the dams in the background just in the distance. Yeah, that's John Day Dam. Uh, oh, okay, there you go. Fantastic. All right, uh, here we go. John Day River. Um, to get to Oregon, the Union Pacific went through some pretty nice country uh, over the Blue Mountains. Uh, one of my favorite places was Huntington, Oregon. Um, at one point, I had a project where I wanted to visit every division point in the United States, and I researched the official guides. Well, I never got to all of them, and I did go to Huntington, which was a busy division point in Union Pacific one time. By the time I got there, there was just a single main track and a siding. Everything else was gone, but it was nice country there, uh, and this train is, uh, I guess it's the first Overland Mail, the first section of the Overland Mail. Union Pacific had some engines geared for 90 miles an hour to handle this train. Uh, they also had these big double centennial units when there were two of them on this train. Yeah, were, those are impressive. Now, you told me the story of how we got this picture into the collection. What what exactly happened there? Well, I wanted this picture in the presentation and, and Scott was going through his scans and for some reason, the scan they had of this one got messed up. I mean, they scanned 46,000 pictures, and uh, I guess a few of them got loused up. So I said, well, I'll I'll dig the negative out. Well, it turns out I had a print of it. So I sent him a scan of the print, and that's what this is. It's just as good as, as the yeah, original. Just as, but, but, but a little bit different uh, source. Than, so you got it, scanned it, sent it to him, and then he was able oh, to no, I, I got it and got a print made. Okay. And then I sent it to him when his scan was no good. Uh, I could have sent him the negative and he could have rescanned it, but the negatives are kept in the freezer and it's a real pain to get them out. Oh, so, sure. Yeah. And then you got to warm them up and do all. Yeah. yeah so let's yeah. just go with this. So this is a great shot. Am I, I'm, I'm what, what time of day do you think? Uh, so midday, I guess. Yeah. Okay. It might, it might be, it might be morning because the front end is dark. Yeah. And, and what time of year? Uh, it's 1979, uh, September. September. All right. Nice yeah. and green. Here we go to the next image. Okay. The, just below Huntington, the Union Pacific crosses the Snake River uh, at a place called Blake's Junction. Uh, it used to be a branch there when they were building a dam on the Snake River, but that was ripped up when the dam was finished. But the, the main line is still there. Uh, this is a, a westbound train, 1979 also. At uh, milepost 536.38, I see. That's probably right. Yeah. Okay. Me measured Ready? and counted the bluffs. I, I think those mileposts come. I'm not come sure. from. Yeah, I don't know where they. I don't know where they measure this. The Oregon. That's more than 500 miles from from Omaha. Maybe, maybe that measures from uh, Granger, Wyoming, where the line takes off. Oh, I bet you're right. I bet it is. Yeah, that makes sense. Have, it would be I, from Granger. I'd have, to, I'd have to look that up. I don't know. Yeah, I'd have to check my check my official facts. Somebody somebody that's a UP fan will probably put something in the chat and let us know. So Robert will fill us in later. So let's go to the next image. Okay. Uh, they, out of Huntington, they climbed up the hills, up the Blue Mountains. This is a place called uh, uh, Weatherby, uh, North Platte Hinkle Freight. This also dates from 79. Now, were you out there on business, or by then you were out there doing no, both, were you? Well, when I was on business, you, you didn't mix business and pleasure. When we get to the Milwaukee section, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Sure. Okay, I'll save that. Yeah, I mean, in the railroad business in those days, if they knew you were a rail fan, you were in deep trouble. And I just I didn't fool around with that. Uh, I kept the two very separate. Uh, so, yeah, all these trips were just to take photographs. Okay. Uh, right. Right. Quite, often, quite often I'd go out after a steam engine. I liked the steam engines. And then, you'd, you know, you'd have a few extra days or something and you'd find, or you'd just run at the stuff. But other trips were just, just to do it, just to go out and shoot the diesels. So, so who would you go with you, Dave Goodhart? And well, I had a number of friends over the years that I've traveled with. Uh, Harold Edmondson was a good friend oh, for a long sure. time. We traveled all over the world together. Um, 
uh, Australian guy, a guy by the name of Greg Triplett, who did a lot of traveling. Uh, I'd done with Nils Huxtable, of course. Uh, Dave Goodhart, when he was alive. Uh, these days, I uh, go around with Jim Thomas a fair bit and uh, a guy named Rick Ahern from Delaware. Uh, yeah, I'd, 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 I used to do it alone, but it got I had a couple of close calls. But it got too dangerous. I just don't do it alone anymore. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Here, let's yeah. look at the next image. Okay, the uh, Idaho part of the Union Pacific Line was pretty interesting also. Uh, here's a picture at uh, Lava, Idaho, uh, westbound freight. Uh, nice clean engine. Uh, got I love the shadows and you got just that that perfect, you know, kind of the light even you, you see the shadow on the on the side of the door i i just thought that this and then the shadows in the background i really thought made this, this snow, an, just an outstanding the, photo the snow throws the light up but it really the snow really helps everything uh, if you get your exposure right uh okay this is lava idaho 2013 okay here we go to the next image wow uh, uh, here's a up local at bancroft idaho uh with a bunch of Jeeps. Uh, I don't know what it's carrying, probably grain. Uh, this dates from 1982. So it's possible to take a picture that's just flat and have it turn into an interesting picture. Well, you had nose on light here. So, you know, we're not going to get any light in the side of the engine. So you, you just, you got to, I think the poles make this picture, but. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just going to say that. So, yeah, yeah, I agree with you, I think. But, but then the way those Jeeps are working, it's cool. Well, yeah, they were working hard. Yeah, and so you can see it's an upgrade. You can see it dropping down behind the train there. Oh, sure. Yeah, so probably a, a train full of loads, and they're just roaring along. So, yep. okay. Speaking of roaring along, let's roar on to the next picture. Now, this is at Incom, Idaho. Uh, this is the mail train once again. Uh, as I said, they had some engines that were geared for ninety miles an hour for these trains, and I think these were some of them. Uh, I forget the exact numbers of the engines. Uh, this is also 1989. Okay, yeah, that's a great spot. That whole canyon in there is uh, out of Pocatello is just a lovely, lovely area. What time of year was this? Uh, that was in May. Yeah, in May. Okay, yeah. So, so, but it's a black and white. But we'll just have to take your word for it that it's green. And I see yeah. over on the left, we've got a couple of your daughters. Uh, favorite bovines uh oh, grazing yeah, cows, cows you know, yes 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 cows, we'll get to the cow stories yeah okay uh, the union pacific had a line they called the washi it went from hinkle up to spokane and up to eastport on the canadian border and uh, traditionally there wasn't much on it but it got very busy uh in modern times because they started moving potash that way uh for export through portland uh Anyway, this is a uh, southbound freight at Ayer, Washington. Oh, it's Ayer. Okay, yeah. The, then the poles kind of make this interesting, and it, it's a inter you know big long train. And what time of year? It looks like August. Uh, October. October. Okay. Yeah. And those those particular engines were kind of captive to that area. They 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 evidently had a speed restriction on them. And that wasn't a very fast line. Uh, they used to get people seasick. They rocked so much. <laughs> That's what I pulled anyway. I never wrote on one. Okay, next. Here we go. Hang on. I'm just, we've got people still uh, coming into the program. So we're admitting them as we go. Welcome, uh, guests. Uh, this is at uh, Pelosi Falls, Washington. And this is one of those potash train, empty potash trains that we talked about. It has a CP engine and a UP engine climbing up. up well, and, you know, and Victor, as we talked about, this was the only other time, the only time that I was ever out taking train pictures with you. And as I recall, we had some problems with the 700. What all happened? Oh, that, yeah, that was that weekend they ran that four-day trip to, to um, Spokane from Portland, and the thing broke down on the fourth day. So, uh, well, it broke down on the third day, I guess, and they, and they took the steam engine off in um, Pasco. So uh, we said, well, what are we going to do? Anyway, uh, Nils Huxtable and I, and I guess you, and my daughter was And with your us. daughter, right? Yeah, we decided to go up uh, Pelosi Falls there, and uh, Nils knew this ranch lady, and she said it was okay to go up in her hillside, which we did. And we got three or four trains, if I recall. It was Yeah, I thought it was a successful day. I mean, you could hear the rattlesnakes buzzing all around you in all directions. 
Anyway, I, I don't remember meeting you then, but I guess if you remember yep. me, you were there. No, I, I remember. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a good consolation to the fact that the seven hundred had broken down. Yeah, this is twenty oh one. Twenty oh one. Yeah, so that would have been then. Okay, ready? Yeah. Uh, the UP engines ran through to Lethbridge, Alberta, across the border at. Uh, um, I just knew that. I just said the name of that town, Eastport. Yeah, and. Yeah. Uh, they they pooled engines. Those same eighty two hundreds went all the way to Lethbridge. So this is in uh, at Cowley, Alberta. You can see all the windmills out there. This is on the way up uh, to the border. Hmm, cool. Mixed freight. Uh, yep. Twenty ten. Twenty. What what year? I'm sorry. Twenty ten. Twenty ten. Got it. Okay. Here we go. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead. Okay. That's not an easy spot to get to. No, this was. A, this, I'll tell you a story about that picture. Uh, I had taken pictures on this Joso bridge before and I knew it was nice, but I said, well, it must be good up, up there. Well, to climb up there from below was pretty rough, but uh, I was with Don Phillips at that point. I traveled a lot with Don and he spotted a, a cellular phone or some kind of tower, maybe microwave on top of the hill. So we, we drove up there and then we get down the hill with all our equipment down to this spot and shot this picture. And then I realized there was no way I was going to get back up that hill with all the stuff I had. So uh, uh, it was me and Harold Edmondson and Don. And Don said, Dear, take my stuff. I'll climb the hill without any weight and get the car. You guys go down to the other railroad to the Northern Pacific was below the bridge there and uh, walk out to the grade crossing and I'll meet you there. So that's what we did. I dragged his stuff to the grade crossing and he went back up and got the car. So you know, that was a few hours effort to get that particular picture but it's worth it oh it's fantastic and of course those that could see in the background you've got that bird right in the middle of the picture number of birds there if you look this is oh there you go yeah, yeah. In, yeah those, in, are, in a, those are not spots on my negative they're birds oh we know that so yeah. and these nice uh basaltic rock formations and the verticality of the bridge uh, just uh, with the clouds in the background yeah, it was something different than the normal bridge picture. So yeah, I, 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 Vic, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think you nailed it. You know, yeah. that one's good. Okay, next. This is the same bridge uh, from down below on the on the joint track there that goes down to Lewiston, Washington. Uh, it's a big bridge. So is the bridge just too big to take a picture of? Do you think, or you you only got part of it? Well, I probably took another one a few minutes, a few seconds before this. I, I can I can change film holders in about four or five seconds. You have to take you have to put the slide in, wind the shutter, turn the slide over, uh, turn the the film holder over, take the slide out. So it might take four or five seconds. So if the train's moving slow enough, I can get a couple. And I probably took one of the whole bridge with this, but I like this one better because the track kind of adds to the composition yeah the add and then you, you've got again you're with that one you only get one click and you've got it just perfectly centered right over the tracks it's just fabulous okay, so 20, 2009 southbound train okay here we go cool. uh out of lewiston there was an operation called the cameras prairie it was joint burlington northern union pacific i think they every six months they switched and uh we were there one time and i knew about this big wooden trestle I'd seen pictures of. So we walked up and got this shot of the local. Went up Grangeville, I think was the place it went to. Yeah, this uh, went to Grangeville. Yeah, you're up in uh, uh, Lapway Canyon, they call it. So yeah, the, town is, the nearest town is Rubens. Rubens, yeah, that's up on the plateau right behind us. So yeah, that's that's a challenging hike to get in there too, isn't it? Yeah, well, you can walk up the railroad or you can, you can walk across some farmer's fields. There's two ways to do it. Um, yeah, Nils like to walk across the bridges. I didn't quite have the. Yeah, no, I did it. We did it across the bridges there. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So it's, it's not that big a deal to walk across the bridge. Yeah, 1987. 1987. Okay, here we go to the next image. Uh, this is a place I wanted to go to. The Union Pacific line across the Milwaukee Road, a place called Marengo. It's way out in the middle of nowhere, one of the more desolate places in the United States that I've been. Uh, and I decided I wanted to get a picture out there. So we drove out one time. Uh, this was uh, 1978. And this is a uh, Hinkle Spokane northbound train. Yeah, they're lovely with the depot still there. And at one time, the Milwaukee Road used this Union Pacific track for their passenger trains that went to Spokane. No, they didn't. They used two different. Oh, yeah, they came back down on this one. Correct. They went up out of... Uh, 
St. Mary's. And, yep. just, and then they came back down this line and got back on their own railroad. That, yeah, got back down on their own railroad. But I, I, I don't want to jump ahead because we, we've got some good stuff coming yet. Stay tuned. Okay, keep going. Uh, UP, I said before, ran that local in the Day Shoot Canyon. Uh, this is an Oak Brook that's the train ran from the Dales to Bend. Uh, had GP30s on it, uh, 1972. Some empty wood chip cars, uh, some of those real cool like grain box cars or something. And I don't know what they were on there. It seems there's two reefers on the front too. I don't know what that was. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah, interesting. Okay, ready? Yep. Here's another shot of the UP local a few years later. This is at Oak Brook uh, also, 1986. This train is the uh, yeah, same direction going towards Bend. So, you know, I was thinking about this picture. And so there's, there's one of two ways that you could get down here. On the far left-hand side is the road. So you could walk down, but there's bluffs that get in the way. So I think what you had to have done is walk down the other side walk through the tunnel and then across the bridge to get to the spot. I don't recall walking through that tunnel. I'm, I'm a little leery of tunnels. Yeah, I'm a little leery too. Otherwise, there's a path that runs kind of from the left of the... Yeah, it I might think be a path that you could have made it there, but still... We didn't go through the tunnel, I'm sure of that. I okay, done. all right. So yeah. anyway, an ambitious shot in a, an outstanding result. It's a nice place. Yes. Ready? I am. Uh, go back to that last one. I got a story to tell you about it. Yeah, here, I'm all yours. Yeah, uh, that railroad was exceedingly slow and unpredictable. Uh, you'd find, you'd hear something was coming. And then remember one day I was out there uh, with Goodhart and Don Phillips. And uh, it was a time when there were 12 kids trapped in the snow on Mount Hood. Oh. And, uh, we went up there because Phillips called in and this paper said, what, where are you? He said, Portland. I said, get up to Mount Hood. So we go up there and uh, all the amateur TV reporters were up there. And anyway, I was listening to, a, I was standing next to a cop car and I hear him on the radio talking to people up on the mountain. So I said, what channel is that? And the officer told me, so I tuned it in and Phillips came over and sure enough, he's listening to the rescue people. And uh, of course he heard the first, when he found the first kid, he heard about it and he was there to meet the helicopter and he took over, made all the rest of them look like chumps. Uh, he, he made his reputation out of that. But anyway, we didn't want to hang around all day. So Goodhart and I went out down to the Oregon trunk and there were supposed to be three trains coming. We sat there for eight hours in the sunshine and not one of them showed up. T total bust. So it was, a, it was a rough place to take pictures. But that happened. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can sympathize. I was 0, 0 for 3 for last year yeah. and finally, uh, finally had some luck down there. Now, what did Don Phillips do? He was a reporter for the Washington Post at the time. Uh, he covered the transportation, which is airplane crashes, railroads, uh, ocean shipping. Uh, he did that for 20 years. And they just happened to be there and broke well, we the story of the rescue. Yeah, well, yeah, well he, he called in. In those days, he always carried dimes because he, he called in all the time to see what was going on. And uh, What a payphone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember what those were? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is for, you know, a trip down memory lane here, Vic. Yeah, and yeah. in any event, he called in and they said, get up to Mount Hood. So we went up there. It was an interesting scene. Uh, I guess the, they rescued most of those kids. I think they all survived. That was good. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, what year was that? That was in... Uh, oh, my, I'd have to defer 86. to you. 86, yeah. 86, okay, yeah. 1986, yeah. folks. So. Yeah, they, oh, no, 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 no. The last picture was 86. I don't remember what year that was. because we Oh, with get... Don Phillips and the rescue on Mount Hood? Yeah, we didn't get any pictures that day. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably not. But looking at this, this was summer, so you probably wouldn't have kids stuck in snow on a day like today. Uh, no, anyway. Yeah. So, so let's anyway, go, let's go to the next one here. Yes, sir. Union Pacific ran their steam engine up to Portland quite a number of times, uh, and I say I like the steam engine. Uh, at this point, it was painted in a two-tone gray. Uh, here it is going over the Blue Mountains at Motanic, Oregon, 1989. And the train was running from Pendleton to Boise that day. It was a uh, deadheading back to Cheyenne after a trip out of Portland. Meet what the, uh, what what's going on on top of the eighty four forty four? There's somebody up there. Know. It looks like somebody's fooling with the sand dome. Must have had sand problems. I don't know. Oh, okay. And so they're 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 stopped, obviously. And then this well, freight is also they, stopped. They, they were just starting up. I, you can see oh. this cylinder cock broken. Oh, there you go. Okay, you're right. You're right. Just starting up. So they're just starting to get rolling again and this freight's in the hole for them yep 
Okay. Next shot. Here we go. Okay. Ten years earlier, they ran another trip up there, and then this was a deadhead trip coming back, uh, crossing the Snake River at Rock Island, Idaho. Now, Victor, I don't see very many contests like this. Three passenger cars, two box cars, and a business car? Well, the business car was probably someone having fun. The passenger cars, maybe they had run up for the excursion, and I probably they probably needed those box cars just for extra braking capacity. Uh, they didn't like to run the engine without a train because it didn't have enough braking capacity. Oh. That's probably probably what was going on there. I don't know. Okay, and what year was this? This was 1979. Wow, that's a great shot. A rare one, too, I would think, because this is a reverse move, so you, someone would have had to tip you off, right? Well, no, no. We, we knew it was going from Portland to Cheyenne, so, okay. <laughs> so it has to figure out. It took them, took them four days, and uh, th this particular spot, though, uh, you got to leave the railroad and drive 40 miles up the Snake River and then 40 miles back on the other side to get into this place. Wow. So it, 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 you gotta you gotta want this picture to I've been in there a couple of times. It's a nice location. Um it's a it's, wonderful location, but that means it's kind of like this is the shot you're gonna get. Well, yeah, yeah. We we plan ahead. We knew about this place. Okay. All right, okay. here we go. Next shot. Yeah, here's here's another one of those deadhead moves. This one, this one they had a water tender and uh, and some diesels behind it. It was coming back. Yeah, you've from, conveniently hid those. Well, yeah, I try to do it. Uh, I also like this kind of angle where you're looking across the rail, uh, low like that, it's, and the lighting is perfect. Mm, the lighting is perfect, and it, it would certainly work. And so you're going upgrade somewhere. Where is this? This is at Peeble, Idaho, and the train was going from uh, Nampa to Green River that day. Mm. And uh, you notice the rods are down. I try and do that when I can. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that's the perfect location. And um, you've got uh, some of your uh, fans in the background, some of the other vehicles. You weren't yeah, alone. Some vehicles on the, on the highway there. Okay, here we go. Uh, here's uh, also 89, probably the same train. Uh, oh. This is Pen Portland to Pendleton, coming along the river at Mino, Oregon. You can see there's a log float in the river, which was rare in those days, but I guess yeah, they kind of stopped doing that. So yeah, that's a great shot. Now you weren't dangling off a cliff on this one, were you? No, I'd probably stand in, I don't know, stand in the woods. Okay. Ready? Yeah, ready. Uh, this is uh, Alexander, Idaho. Uh, this train was going from Nampa to Green River, 89. These are all taken on the same trip, I think, 89. Okay. Uh, Took them now you use days. a little bit of compression on this photograph. Yeah, I don't normally do that, but uh, this this one, maybe I was getting bored with the other stuff. Well, I think it was the lighting. The lighting was nose on here, so I, I, I thought it would work, and it did work out fine. Uh, I don't often use telephotos because I don't like to make the engines look weird, but head on like this, it's okay. Okay, great. Here we go. Wow. Uh, what do we got here? Golf, Oregon. Uh, pan shot. Uh, Robert Hale used to do this kind of stuff. And, I tried it once in a while uh, from a moving car, and you take about twenty, and you might get one that works. But this one, this one worked out okay. Um, yeah. So, now, so who was driving? Do you think? Do you remember? Well, probably Don. I don't know. Uh, one of the other guys, and I was in the back seat. Okay, because you weren't trying to drive and get the picture uh, at the same time. I, mean, I may be crazy, but I'm not that crazy. Okay, guy. Well, you you certainly nailed it. Now, is the crew waving at you? Then it looks like. Uh, yeah, that's Steve Lee. <laughs> oh, is it? He, he he ran that thing for years. He was he was a friend. Uh, yeah, oh. I guess I guess they're waving at us. I don't know. Okay. Great shot. Let's go to the next one. Okay, here's uh, once again probably that same train. Uh, yeah. This excursion, Portland Pendleton, uh, along the Columbia. This is at the Dales. You can see the Dales Dam in the background. A nice place. Yeah, it's a great shot. Yeah. That's very good. Here, let's look at the next one. Uh, well, they, they ran the Challenger up there once or twice also, and I like the Challenger, so went up. Uh, this picture is taken uh, at Swan Lake, Idaho, 1982, and it had a particularly nice-looking train, I recall. Uh, you can see uh, you can see how big the Challenger was. The tender just dwarfs that baggage car. This thing is monster. So, um, well, I mean, this one looks small compared to the big boy, but <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. But it's yeah, a pretty, pretty nice engine. I, I always like that 3985. Oh, yeah, it's a beauty, and she's working and at pace and the whole thing, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Amtrak ran up that way as well. Uh, not that I'm a big Amtrak fan, but uh, they ran a few trains. Uh, they ran the Pioneer from 1977 to 97, which connected with the uh, Chicago uh, Oakland train and Salt Lake City. Well, Ogden first, then Salt Lake City. And it ran for 20 years, uh, Salt Lake City to Portland. Uh, here it is at Goff, Oregon, going east, 1979. Next, here it is at Huntington, Oregon, going the other way, going west, also 1979. You can see the baggage car in the rear. Mm. It didn't, didn't care which end it was on. Actually, mm. in fact, ran a lot of baggage cars on the rear end. Uh, this is Huntington, Oregon, 1979. Uh, the Amtrak ran the Empire Builder out of Seattle along the former Great Northern. Uh, this picture is at Mulkiteo, Washington. Uh, the Seattle, Chicago Empire Builder. Yeah, it's working hard late in the afternoon. At, you know, about a, about a five o'clock departure out of Seattle. That's uh, yeah. This that's, was late. This was taken. No, it was taken in October. So yeah, yeah, it's about right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you got that nice afternoon kind of almost glintyish light, and uh, yeah, that's a that's a beauty, yeah. as the Canadians would say. Okay, and then here is the Portland section of the Empire Builder, which united with the other piece of it at Spokane, uh, leaving Portland. Um, okay, this is also nineteen eighty nine. Nineteen eighty nine. All right. One eighty eight actually. I oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, Amtrak still runs the Coast Starlight by the uh, former SP line. Uh, here it is in Portland Union Station. It must have had engine trouble that day because the SP gave him a helper engine. Now, do we know who the picture, person in the picture is? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. I was wondering if it was maybe one of your friends or something. It's just some random person. It's just some customer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Early okay. afternoon, it looks like. Uh, quintessential that, scene of Union Station. Yeah, that thing left like Two, three o'clock, I forget. Yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. Um, this looks cold. Yeah, it's cold. They ran the North Coast Hiawatha on the former Northern Pacific. Uh, when Amtrak started up in 71, um, I guess it was uh, April 1st, they cut that train off. Uh, within a month, Senator Mansfield from Montana made such a stink, they put the train back on. And at first it ran Minneapolis Spokane in conjunction with the Empire Builder. Uh, eventually uh, they ran all the way from Chicago to Seattle as a separate train. Um, I was- Where are we? There at uh, Livingston, Montana in 1972. Looks uh, cold. It was cold, yeah, because I, I had been out there to photograph the Milwaukee Road um, and we were on our way back. We rode the train from Boise, uh, from. Uh, excuse me, Butte to uh, Chicago. And uh, I was sitting in the dome with my camera on the table and the conductor came by to talk, started talking to me. Turns out it was Warren McGee. Who really? Well-known photographer. He was number one on the uh, seniority roster. So he held the passenger train and uh, nice to talk to him. He's one of the guys I knew as a kid. I knew he was one of the greats and he oh, was. Sure. Yeah. So what time of year is it? This looks like January or something? December 7th, 1972. December 7th, 72. All right. Here we go to the next image. Okay. Get to the SP now. Uh, original SP line went over the Siskiyou Mountains and had severe grades. Uh, this is a place called Klamathon, Oregon. Uh, this train went down to Black Butte, connected with the SP main line. And went up through all the lumber territory and ended up in Eugene. Uh, it's a short line today, but we're still there, actually. Uh, this is 1991. Um, it looks like you must have got some sun after being in clouds most of the day. You got clouds in the background. Well, you never know. I mean, the sun comes out sometimes. If the sun doesn't come out, I usually just put the film away. <laughs> uh, I, some guys accuse me of only taking pictures in the sunshine, which probably is the case. Well, I okay. do a few in bad weather, but not too often. Here we go. Here's uh, a good shot. 1926, uh, Southern Pacific built the Natron Cutoff, which skirted Mount Shasta, and the grades were much easier than Siskiyou. And 
but it was a better railroad altogether, and that became the main line. Uh, and it, as I said, it went by Mount Shasta, which I liked very much. There were a lot of really nice spots up there. So we went up there a number of times. Uh, I knew the SP pretty well because I I'd, I'd done a lot of consulting work for them. They were one of my main clients. I, I think over the years I did 27 different consulting jobs for that company. Uh, but I, I got all over the railroad and uh, needless to say, this area was was one of my favorites. This is a uh, eastbound at Andesite, 1986. The, the prior picture, which you turned off pretty quick, was from 1981 at Cougar. This is 81 at Cougar, and this is 1986 at? Andesite. Andesite. Which, uh, so it's going upgrade? Yeah, they're going, well, yeah, they're, yeah, they're both going upgrade. Uh, okay. The grade starts at Dunsmuir, I guess, and uh, it's pretty steady to Klamath Falls. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty nice piece of railroad. Um, okay, keep going here. Uh, this is at Heather, Oregon, uh, with a eastbound freight. Excuse, no, it's a westbound. <laughs> On the Southern Pacific, everything going towards San Francisco was west. And away from San Francisco was east. So even though this train was going south, it was going towards San Francisco. So it was considered a westbound. A westbound. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's quite a spot. So you drove, just drove around on the Forest Service roads until you yeah, found we, a spot. We walked around on the Forest Service roads. I doubt we walked very far. But uh, and I, didn't, I didn't cut those trees down. Someone else did. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is the same train, actually, at Cruzat up the hill a little bit. Notice the old water tank still there and the SB signal bridge. Um, yeah, that's lovely. What time of day? It's getting to be more like afternoon now. It's probably afternoon. Uh, Cruise at this is 1986. Yeah, that's lovely. Beautiful. Wonderful. Here we go to the next image. Okay, I went up uh, quite often to see the 4449, which I liked very much. Uh, a beautiful engine and with a nice train. Um, and uh, Doyle McCormick, who organized the thing and ran it, was a good friend. And uh, we had some awful good times following that train. Um, this picture is at Keg, California, excursion from Sacramento to Klamath Falls in 1991. Is that Keg, K-E-G-G? -G? Keg, yes. Yes. Okay. 1981. 91. 91. Sorry, that, I knew that. that, that, I, that I said train, the wrong thing. The engine was not resurrected till 1982. And okay. I came out, I had broken my leg in Philadelphia in the service of Conrail, and I was in a cast up to my hip, but I heard that engine was coming out, and I went out there for it, okay? And I recall uh, I learned about the problems disabled people have on that trip. I had my camera around my neck on a, on a belt, and I was walking with crutches. And I, I remember at one point we got out of the car and everybody started running for a shot and I fell over on my face in the mud. Oh, yeah. it was it was pretty frustrating, but I was not going to miss the daylight coming out. Of course, I got it many times thereafter. But I remember that first trip. Um, OK, yeah, this one's at Keg. Let's go to the next. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's at Black Butte and Mount Shasta behind there. It's in July, so there isn't too much snow in the mountain. Uh, You'll notice uh, the train is making good smoke and working, but it was going downhill on a 1% grade. Uh, we talked to Doyle McCormick ahead of time and told him where we'd be and said, uh, put a little brake on, see what you can do. So he put a little brake on and opened her up, and this is the result. Uh, that's one of my favorites. This one hangs in my living room. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you got smoke, but not too much, so you could still see the mountain. It's just perfectly balanced. Well, a lot of <laughs> it was it was smoking pretty good there. Yeah, anyway, it's a good shot. Um, this is a Crescent Lake, 1991, on a Portland Klamath Falls trip. Well, it was going in, it was going down to uh, San Francisco, of course. They they ran that engine quite a bit on long trips. So I remember it went down one time out near Los Angeles for a, a Disney movie. Another time they ran it all the way to New Orleans, and we followed that thing from Portland into Texas and then back. Uh, I really like that engine. That's a beauty. I mean, perfect shot. Driver's down. Nice uh, plume of smoke and uh, perfect lighting. The, try and get the rods down when I can. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. This is at Algoma, Oregon, coming into Klamath Falls. Notice there's a bird up in the 
exhaust there, but nothing I could do about that. No. Nope. Yeah, it's a beautiful color shot. Uh, nice and low uh, along the along the uh, lake, isn't it? Climate Lake, yeah, very nice yeah. place. Okay, all right, well, you ready? Yeah, this date from ninety one. Okay, here's another shot at Crescent Lake from ninety two. Uh, it was uh, Portland Klamath Falls that day. I think that train was on its way down to the NRHS convention in San Jose that year. Uh, that train looked nice. Yeah, beautiful, all matching and stuff. Yeah, back in the days. Look good, look good. Um, okay, next. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, it's uh, also 1992, going back to Portland. Uh, Doyle McCormick is leaning out with a big smile on his face, as you can see. Yeah. Going 70 miles an hour, he was sure having a good time running his big engine. Uh, he liked He liked that engine, he still does. Uh, this is at Tumult, Oregon. This is 1992. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, you ready? This is at Westfer, Oregon, 1986. Portland Klamath Falls trip. Kind of a short train. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't remember what was going on there. It seems it got the observation on the rear, doesn't it? Oh, you know, you're right. Yeah, maybe they, they, yeah, they did that purposely. That, that must have been something for uh, SP officials. They sometimes took people out and entertained them with that thing. Uh, I don't recall what it was. I'd have to look in my notes and see. Uh, yeah, and the uh, the water car doesn't look too bad. No, no, because it matched. It looked yeah. fine. Yeah. A uh, couple of times when I was involved with steam engines, I tried to get them to buy a baggage car and put water tanks in. We actually did some engineering studies to figure out how much water you could get in and not exceed the weight limits. Uh, but nobody ever did it. It's a shame because uh, the baggage cars would have looked a lot better than these things that they have. Well, that's a good point. Okay, next. Next case. They also ran uh, the 44, 49 down to Bend a couple of times. Here it is on the Spokane, Portland, Seattle, uh, BNSF. That Mount Hood off to the left in the background. Correct. Uh, out to Wishram. It looks like a little bit of a breezy day on the Columbia River. We see a few white caps. No, yeah, it's always windy out there, isn't it? Yeah, well, pretty much of the time. Yeah, you got to get used to it. So, Lyle, Washington, 1998. Lyle, Washington, 98. Okay, here we go. And here is uh, the 4449 in the Portland Union Station, uh, 1984, not too long after it first came out. Yeah, that's a beautiful shot. That was for the trip. Um, wasn't that the trip that went all the way to Texas, or was it? Might have been. I, I, I'd have to look in my notes to see. I didn't. I didn't mention it in this. Yeah, we that, that Texas trip was pretty good. <laughs> well, I went all the way to Louisiana actually, but we 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 broke off uh, west of San Antonio, figuring it was going to get flat and ugly, which it which it did. But we went back a month later and picked it up and came back to Portland with it. So. Got plenty of pictures of the thing. It, it actually ran without the water tank for a few days because it had a hot box. So that oh, was, the water tank did? Yeah, that was particularly nice. We were pleased oh, sure. I, I was accused of putting sand in the journals, but it wasn't me. Oh, okay. All right. Here we go to the next image. That oh! Milwaukee Road. Uh, I knew about the Milwaukee Road because I'd seen pictures that other people had taken and made a couple of trips there to get the electrics in the early 70s. Uh, this is 1972, a place called Bonner Junction. Uh, I was with Don Phillips that day, and I remember it was 38 degrees below zero when we got up that morning. It looks cold in this picture. Uh, it was cold, yeah. We were dressed for it and got some pretty nice stuff on that trip. Uh, so is that the Northern Pacific in the background then? It is on the other side of the river, yeah. Okay. And a pair of uh, little Joes and moving little Joes and they were dragging a switcher going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, going somewhere with something. So, Hilt's, lovely shot. Hilt says that was the World's Fair of Daylight going Portland to uh, the World's Fair in New Orleans, nineteen eighty four. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Well, thank you for the for the uh, for the update on that. So, beautiful shot here in the afternoon. It looks like on a beautiful no, winter no, day. No, that's the morning actually. Oh, this is a morning, so this would be an eastbound. Um, let's see. Honor Junction. Well, That's I don't know. It's not important. Bound, but it was in the morning. I remember yeah, that was okay. All right. You, okay. And it, it, go ahead. Yeah, Leachman says it's westbound in the morning. Westbound in the morning. Okay, got it. All right. Um, okay. Ready to move on? 
Here's a shot at Alberton, Montana, a couple of little Joes on a, on a uh, westbound freight, 1974. A little snow on the ground. Liked it out there in the winter. No, I'm actually, certain. this was not, this was not winter. It was, oh, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, this is, no, this is 72. Excuse me, I was looking at the wrong caption. The same trip, 1972, snow on the ground. Okay, and, and that snow just adds all the highlights to the rockery and, and then you hiked into this spot? I guess. I can't remember the details of it. Okay. Well, it's 50 years ago. Yeah, that's true. Okay, here we go to the next one. Henderson, Montana, uh, with a westbound, uh, 1974, this one is. And you notice there's a diesel behind the electric. They had a setup where they could multiple unit the electrics with diesels, which they, they did in the last years, the electrification. And uh, that was quite a common occurrence. Uh, this is at Sudan, Montana. Uh, yeah, just well, late in the day and uh, just got the light right in that little pocket. Yeah, 72. Ready? Yep. Nope. Hang on. I, uh, I'm stuck again for a second here. <laughs> Hang on. There we go. Uh, here's a picture of a westbound at... Uh, Swaltees, Montana. No, no, I think you skipped one. Did I? No, there's this one, and then there's this one. Well, where are the box cabs? Try the next one. No? Yeah, 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 oh, okay. there's the box cabs, right. Okay. Do you want go to go back. back one? Yeah, go back to Swaltees. Okay, so this one? Westbound, yeah. And you notice right. it's, got, it's got diesels emued in with it. Was, and it got cows in the foreground. Cows in the foreground. They look like they're cold. Yeah. Uh, 1974. Auto racks heading for the auto loading facility at Kent, Washington. I guess. Ready? Yeah. This is uh, salt. This, that other one was Sudan, Montana. This is salties with the uh, box cabs. Uh, they were not working. They were being taken out to the west coast, I guess, uh, after being chopped. But they were in the. They were still running them. But I never did much with the box cabs. Uh, There's limit to what you could do. Yeah, there. Uh, there's a box car between them, and it doesn't look like they have pantographs anymore. No, they have pantographs, but they're not up. So I, yeah. think, I think they were just falling them somewhere. Uh, okay. 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 Right. Keep going. Hang on for a second. Just. Stuck for a second here. There we go. Okay, on that trip that I met Warren McGee, I told you on the north coast of Hiawatha. Well, sure right. enough, uh, we were at Jefferson Island, Montana, and a Milwaukee freight on the parallel line showed up. I got this picture out of the dome. Uh, thank goodness they washed the dome window. Yeah, it's perfect timing. T total. That's that's just uh, that's just good luck all the way around. Well, and you say Warren McGee was and the and conductor, and, and, and there was fog, uh, and and the fog was kind of getting in the way. But anyway, it worked out just pure luck. Sometimes you get lucky. This is 1972 on the North Coast Hiawatha, of course. Right. Uh, Columbia River Bridge, the Milwaukee uh, at Beverly, Washington. 1979, electrics were gone by then, but the catenary supports were still there. Yeah, State Parks has, um, has paved that bridge, and it's now a walking and bicycle trail. Yeah, well, probably pretty windy. I wouldn't go out there on a windy day. I know they, they had trains blow off that bridge in the old days. Um, let's go next. Um, I particularly like the gap, uh, which was the section between the two electrified sections. Uh, in the late 70s, I was working, uh, doing consulting work for the trustee of the Milwaukee Road, which is, of course was bankrupt, and I was doing the operating studies that eventually led to the abandonment of the Pacific Extension. Um, as a part of my owner's duties, I had a high rail most of the Milwaukee Road. And this one day I was high railing from Tacoma to Avery, Idaho, with the superintendent of the Washington Division, and we came upon this beautiful place at place called Rock Lake. And uh, I used to carry two notebooks. Uh, the left-hand one was for photographic locations and the right-hand one was for business. Uh, as I mentioned before, I never mixed the two. Uh, it was a kiss of death to be known as a rail fan in those days. Um, anyway, I went back 
shortly thereafter and took some pictures. You'll see what's going on here. Go to the next one. This is the other side of that tunnel at Rock Lake with a uh, westbound train, 1978, these date from. Yeah, it's tough to get back there. Not many people have shots from this location. Well, uh, we discovered it. I went looking for it because I had seen it on the high rail trip. We went looking for it and we found a rancher who looked like we were in the area. We asked him, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, take my tractor and go up top of that hill. You'll see the tunnel here. So we took his tractor and went up and there was the tunnel. Well, uh, go to the next picture. Next morning, we were at Malden, Washington, and there was a train going west. And the crew was there uh, waiting to change. So we said, uh, hey, we're going to be up at Rock Lake. Uh, can you go slow by there? And they said, well, don't worry. The track's so rotten. We go slow anyway. So uh, sure enough, we went out and set up. And the uh, train came by at about 15 miles an hour, passed us, stopped, backed up, and did it again. Wow. <laughs> so the crew certainly took care of us. Uh, this was in 1978. No, 79. 79. Seventy-nine, getting towards the end. I see a switch engine what? tucked a couple of cars back in the contest. Yeah, it was. It was towards the end. Uh, I guess nineteen eighty is when they finally pulled the pin on the west coast. Uh, right. It was interesting work. Uh, two years, I I worked on that Milwaukee road. Got to know that railroad pretty well. Um, so it couldn't be saved. Not the West End. Mm, okay. What, what happened had to happen. I remember a guy named uh, Bill Brodsky organized an outfit called save our railroad employment sore and he was getting all the politicians involved and it just the railroad never should have been built first secondly by the time you know the bridges had a 75 year design lifespan and it was 75 years everything was shot the track was bad they had they had a little more traffic than traditionally because of the burlington northern merger but it wasn't enough to keep it going i i, I did an analysis one time if they had just run their trains over union pacific at high speed, they'd have saved hundreds of engines. <laughs> of course, Union Pacific would not have allowed that. But uh, in any event, it went away and it should have gone away. What's what's left of the Milwaukee Road is what's viable. And other people run it now. Okay. Okay. Next. Ready? Yep. Uh, I told you I particularly like the Gap. There are really nice places out there. Here's a, here's a concrete bridge at a place called Rosalia, Washington. This dates from 79. Uh, I took a lot of pictures out there towards the end because, as I say, I was working on the road and I knew I knew what was going away. So we, we made quite a number of trips uh, to different places, not just the Pacific Northwest. We also did the Midwestern Omaha line and Great Falls line, a lot of that stuff. OK. Here's a place called Yuan, Washington. Uh, you can see that siding is in pretty crummy shape. Uh, more automobiles. You say they were going to Kent. Yeah, they. Yeah, that was a coup for the Milwaukee back in the '60s with the Union Pacific. They closed the Kent Airport and built the unloading facility there, and split it with the UP. It's still there today. Now it's just UP. Yeah, but now they run solid trains here. They already run on a few cars. It looked like. Well, there's covered covered cars behind there. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. there was a little traffic on the thing. Okay, next case. This wow. Is a vessel at Hillcrest. Uh, Washington, number 201, westbound, 1979. You don't see too many pictures at this spot. I don't remember how we got in there, but we got there. A few cows in the picture, so it adds some atmosphere. That's good. Okay, okay you ready? Here's a grain train at Rosalia going west, uh, 1978. Hmm. They actually had plans to electrify this section because when they numbered the substations, they left space for the substations on the gap because it was never built. But they were planning. Was that because they split the passenger service and ran that up to Spokane and, and not no, through no, the no, gap? Just, it, it, the grades weren't as bad there. So uh, that, that electrification was a, a kind of a publicity stunt on the part of uh, Anaconda Copper and uh, Westinghouse. They, they electrified a number of railroads. One of them was the Mexicano in Mexico. The other was the Milwaukee. I don't think the Milwaukee paid a penny for that. It was oh. just, for, yeah, I mean, I don't know the details of it, but uh, I suspect someone who knows the history will find out that it was all paid for by, by uh, uh, Westinghouse and Anaconda Copper. Uh, Makes sense. Ready? Anyway, by the time they were going to do the gap, the depression came along, and of course that never happened. Okay. 
Here's a lovely spot. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Uh, that bridge has since been, I guess it, part of it fell down. They rebuilt it. doesn't look as good these days, but that's uh, uh, Ramsdale, Idaho, crossing Bennett. Benoit Lake, it's called. Yeah, the Benoit train Lake, came, yeah. Came out of St. Mary's and, and uh, it was nice, nice area. Kind of an interesting train, some empty wood chip cars and then some loaded auto racks and then a bunch of grain. So it's just kind of a hodgepodge. Whatever they had, they moved. Yeah. Oh, you ready for this one? Yeah, yeah. This is a PD trestle. The interesting story behind this one uh, said I was working for the trustee and I was out there all week and uh, decided to stay the weekend and take some photographs. Well, uh, my boss, a guy named Chuck Hoppy, wonderful guy, uh, he also wanted to high rail this section. He was he was a little bit of a rail fan himself. Well, a lot of a rail fan, actually. So uh, Saturday, he sets up a high rail trip. And of course, I was out taking pictures. And uh, I'm standing up on the hill here at PD, and I hear the high rail car leaving town. So I had to go up and hide in the woods. because I didn't want the boss seeing me out there with a the camera. And uh, then after the high rail went by, this train came and <laughs> got this picture. Okay, That's now we'll a great move, shot. We'll move to Canada. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, both the CN and the CP main lines uh, run in the canyon of the thompson Fraser Rivers, and it's pretty spectacular country. Uh, uh, today, they share tracks on a directional basis in certain areas, but uh, back in the, in the day, of course, they ran on their own railroad. Uh, CN had these rock slide sheds, which protected the track from the rock slides. Pretty, pretty rough country. Um, this is an eastbound freight at Pitqua. Yeah, those uh, rock uh, rock sheds looks like they're are hard at work in this picture. Just oh, gravel doing, raided down on them. Doing their job. Uh, yep, doing their job. And let me do mine and move to the next image. 1992. I was up on one of those rock sheds one time. They're 48 inches thick. Solid really? timber. Yeah. yeah. They're taking a lot of weight. Oh, well, yeah, um, a lot of weight. Yes, I was thinking that too. Yeah. Okay, this is a nice place called Ashcroft, British Columbia. Uh, this is 2010. Uh, CP is in the foreground, CN line on the bridge there is in the background. Uh, it was pretty busy there. This is an empty train train on the Canadian Pacific. And uh, keep this spot in mind for the next shot. You ready? Next shot is a CN train on that bridge that you saw in the last picture. It's a westbound sulfur train. So you would have been up on that hill off to the right when you took the previous picture. Correct. Yeah, yeah you could just go up and down that hill, move to different places. Uh, there are a number of locations there. There was a, a road that went out to a tie plant out in the canyon there. So that was, that was where we went. Yeah, perfect uh, shot, perfect time of day. And this is the Thompson River? Uh, yeah, that's Thompson. Know. It's a Thompson, yeah, I believe yeah. it's a Thompson. Okay, here we go. You ready for the next shot? Next one. Uh, this is a place called Wallachin, uh, which is almost up, almost up towards Kamloops. Uh, it's kind of rough to get into, a long ways from the paved highway. But I remember we had a flat tire in there, and uh, luckily, what kind the, of vehicle? Well, it was a suburban, and the, the manual was in there because to change a tire in a suburban, you you have to know what's going on, but you, you have to use a extension shaft to get the hard to jack up and anyway we've got it changed and got out of there and then had to buy a new tire but we made it but uh it was a pretty nice location there cp is on that same canyon on the same side of the river but up higher okay ready yep. uh this is uh the supercontinental train number one westbound on canadian national before via at a place called valemont uh, 1976 via didn't come into being till 78 i think a you know, lovely uh, set of matching F units yeah. with a beautiful train. Oh, they were nice trains. Uh, CN did a good job. And you've ridden on those trains a few times, haven't you? Oh, yeah. I did. Uh, well, I I worked uh, those lines, a number of consulting jobs. I, I actually worked for CN directly for almost two years uh, when they first were uh, making the transition from uh, Crown Corporation to a real company. <laughs> they went. They went from twenty-two thousand, uh, from forty-four thousand to twenty-two thousand people in about two years, and the railway ran just as well. Uh, but they were they were running the passenger service, and of course they realized it was a loser. But VIA hadn't come into being yet. A couple of years later, the government finally got wise and established VIA. But yeah, CN was a 
busy railroad, but I was all over it. And then a number of years later, we did a job for the Canadian Grains Board, mm. where I had to uh, go over, we were looking at the movement of grain into the port of Vancouver and Prince Rupert. And uh, needless to say, more onerous duty. I had to ride all those lines in the locomotives and check them out. So yeah, I've been all over that part of the country. That's, they're both nice railroads. Okay, that's uh, the supercontinental. So here's your next shot. Yeah, uh, this interesting story on this uh, in 1982, my wife was invited to a medical conference in Jasper. Uh, she was given a paper there and I went along as a spouse. And I had seen a picture taken uh, in the 20s, a CN publicity picture at a spot with uh, Mount Robeson behind it. You can see Mount Robes in there. And I decided I was going to go find that place. So I went hunting up the dirt roads and here, there, and everywhere, walking. And I finally found the place. It was off one of those rock sheds. Uh, you can see uh, there are two railroads here. At, by this time, Canadian National had built a cutoff from the Prince Rupert line uh, back up to the main line to give them a little more flexibility in the Yellowhead Pass. Uh, and this is that stretch of railroad there. Anyway, this is a westbound. Uh, what about what time of year? Uh, this is in September uh, of '82, and the location is Maury, British Columbia. M O R R E Y. M O R E Y. M O R E Y. Okay, here we go to the next image. Uh, this is also at Maury, from a little higher up the hill, uh, and uh, you can actually see the Prince Rupert line in the background there, if, uh, hmm. on the left side. Uh, I think there's a train on it, actually. Uh, it's a lovely spot late in the afternoon, you think? Uh, midday, now late in the afternoon, you'd have shot. Yeah, 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 probably. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right All right. Here, let's go to the next image. September. This is a place called Emporaire, not Emperor, Emporaire, in the same area. But this from track level, I guess I was walking back out to my car and this train came by. Uh, Looks like a comfortable day. The engineer has his window open. Yeah, you know, it was September. Nice weather out there in September. Yeah. And we had, I remember I had four beautiful days out there when my wife was at that conference. Okay. Uh, east of Jasper was pretty good scenery too. This is a place called Snaring. Uh, this is in the National Park and the uh, Park Service declared the road one way for 12 hours and the other way for 12 hours. Well, needless to say, we broke the law by coming back out within the 12 hours, but yeah, there was some good pictures out there. Uh, this is, I said, snaring, also 1982. Okay. Uh, Via runs there Canadian on the CN these days, rather than the CP, and, and it does go through Jasper. And here, here it is in 2007, number two east, going from Vancouver to Toronto. Train didn't go through to Montreal anymore. Uh, they cut that out years ago. All right. Now, Here's CP, a great shot. CP's line is probably more spectacular than the CN's. Uh, I think it's a beautiful railroad, and, and they ran the Canadian that uh, when before Via, they ran the Canadian also. A class operation. I rode it with my wife one time, and it, everything was terrific. Um, of course, I photographed it also. This is Otter Tail, BC, uh, westbound Montreal, Vancouver, uh, the Canadian. Today, today they put a power line through there, which kind of messed it up for photographs, but that always happens. Yeah, okay. this is a perfect pre-power line photo. So this is great. Here we go to the next image. This a couple of years later, 1978, same train, uh, except it's eastbound, uh, number two, Vancouver, Montreal, Cloister, British Columbia, uh, 1978. Uh, this spot's been messed up also when they, they doubled the Trans-Canada Highway. They built a new bridge here and it kind of messed the scene up. Yeah, lovely with those pair of uh, F units with those, were they ice breakers up on the top of those? Yeah, so for the tunnels, uh, yeah. the, cut the icicles down. Yeah, okay, ready? Yeah. Next. Here you go. Okay, here's the Canadian climbing kicking horse pass between the two, two spiral tunnels, uh, Yoho, BC. That's a famous place. Uh, the Canadians don't like to uh, cut trees. So uh, today you're at an overlook on the highway and there's a sign saying about the spiral tunnels and all that. And today you go up there and you can't see the track. I remember being up there one time, a 
busload of Japanese tourists stopped and said, where's the railway? You know, <laughs> can't see it. Oh, well, the trees used to, used to be lower. Anyway, this is a Canadian going up the Kicking Horse Pass. At uh, Yolo. Yoho or Yolo? Yoho. Okay, here we go. Yoho ho, off we go. Uh, here's a freight train coming out of the uh, lower spiral tunnel to, from the same location, but different time of day. Uh, it was pretty busy freight line. A uh, lot, of, lot of traffic there. Okay. This is a famous place called Morant's Curve, where the CP's photographer, Nicholas Morant, often took pictures. Uh, just a spectacular location. Uh, this is near Lake Louise. This dates from 2006, double stack train. It's just lovely with the um, with all the snow still hanging in the trees like that. Yeah, yeah, that's that happens out there sometimes when you get that kind of wet snow. Yeah, here we go to the next image. This is uh, also at Yoho, uh, at Mount Stephen in the background. Um, eastbound freight, 1976. Okay, here we go. Oh, no, yeah, you like this locomotive, don't you? That locomotive, well, I like Royal Hudson's. Uh, I actually owned one at one time with a couple of friends, um, which is another story. But anyway, they uh, this was in 78. They ran it across the country with a museum train. And of course, we went out and chase the thing. It was pretty nice. Here it is between the two spiral tunnels. You can see in the background the smoke coming out of the tunnel. And it's uh, on its way. Next and shot. this would be its uh, native track, right? Well, no, the Royal Hudson's didn't run here because this is the mountains. They had something called Selkirk, which was like a big Royal Hudson. <laughs> it was a 2104. Look, look, same kind of streamlining, but you know, this was mountain territory. Those engines were for uh, mostly uh, in the prairies in Ontario. Okay. Here we go to the next image. Yeah, here it is coming up out of the first tunnel out of field, and that's Mount Stephen in the background. This is a place called Cathedral. Hmm. Uh, the reason they have those signs on the front is when uh, one of these engines called the Royal Train when uh, the King and Queen of England came over in 1939, so they got permission to call them Royal Hudson's. And on that trip, they had Canadian Pacific Railway and a sign like that. So when they took the thing out to British Columbia, of course, they had a and to put their name on it, so they did. Anyway, it look, looks pretty good. Nice engines. Oh, sure. Uh, 40 years later, they resurrected another steam engine, the 2816. And here it is at Morant's Curve, same place. Um, this is in 19, uh, excuse me, 2006. And we got this shot. Go to the next one. Another shot on the same trip of the 2816 uh, at Storm Mountain, Alberta. What, uh, what's right behind the locomotive? It looks like a boxcar or something. Yeah, that was a water tank they had. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Ready? yeah, well, I'll tell you a story about the 2816. I actually got a picture of that thing in regular service in 1959 in, um, no, I think 58 in Montreal. <laughs> so it was, it was fun to see it get resurrected 50 years later. Uh, beautiful engines. So. Called them Unroyal Hudson's. Oh, okay. Next. Uh, CP had some coal lines that went south out of Golden down to a couple of mines, and uh, that was pretty interesting country. Uh, this is at Canal Flats, British Columbia, coal train going north. Coal went to Roberts Bank for export. Uh, this is what, yeah. your, what your friend Nils calls a one shot wonder with one engine on the front and another one in the rear. Hmm. Yeah, I, luckily I, it looks like you've got some rain in the background so it's very yeah, atmospheric yeah it was it was one of those days where you were fighting it. okay fighting keep... the weather here we go we only have a few fo photos left folks we're almost done um cp ran a uh heritage chain uh i think they still do actually they had f units on it and they ran it for different things this was a fishing expedition train take took people out the locations to fish this is at fabro bc uh, okay, we better speed this up if you're telling people we're going to show. No, up. we're getting there. We are just but, but, but the Canadian stuff is we're getting towards the end. Yeah, we're coming to British Columbia Railway now, formerly the Pacific Great Eastern Railroad, which was uh, fairly busy. Here's a southbound freight at Birkin. You can see there's a lot of lumber. Um, 
It was nice country out there on British Columbia. Next case, here's another freight uh, at Mount Curry, British Columbia. I kind of like this picture because of that cloud on the mountain there. And, and the well, edge. and that really cool rock formation, you know, right yeah. behind the locomotive helps too. Yeah, that's a nice, nice, very picture. nice shot. Okay, uh, go to the next one. You know, the British Columbia used uh, RDC cars for their passenger service. They had a bunch of them, and uh, they'd run multiples. You normally didn't see more than one or two of these together. Uh, so this thing ran every day from North Vancouver to Prince George in both directions. Uh, this is at Hickson, British Columbia, 1988. Okay, uh, the British Columbia Railway also ran the Canadian Pacific Royal Hudson for the tourists uh, from Squamish down to North Vancouver and ran along uh, the inlet there, the nice spots. Uh, I already went it's along How Sound. Yeah, How Sound. Uh, nice. Anyway, this place called Porto, 1992. Uh, one time they ran a circle trip out of Vancouver, uh, came out on the Canadian National. I remember they had the 6060. Uh, and uh, Jasper, they went down the line to Prince George, and then they went back to Vancouver on the British Columbia Railway. And the British Columbia section of it, they had this 3716 uh, uh, consolidation, and they had the Royal Hudson behind it. Uh, we followed that for a couple of days. It was it was good fun. Uh, this is at Lone Butte, BC. You can see some other photographers there on the right, which uh, and an enclosed water tower. Yeah, yeah, it got cold out there. Yeah, well, it gets cold. Yeah, I get that. Okay, ready? Uh, here's a same train uh, showing the Hudson and the Consol going at the place called West Ply, BC. Mm. Once again. With a water car in between them. Yeah. Yeah. And you said that those logos got added later? The, oh, yeah. When it got to British Columbia, Canadian Pacific just had the crown on the, on the running board. Okay. And, the, yeah, and the beaver on the cab, of course, with the, the British Columbia Railway dolled it up. Ready? There. Yep. Okay, here's the same train coming down the mountain into Lillooet. Uh, say, pretty spectacular country out there. Really, really nice area. Uh, it's not very busy today because Canadian National bought the railroad and they uh, short circuited all the freight to go east at Prince George into Jasper. So uh, it's only local service down there now, very little traffic. I haven't been out there in a number of years. Probably some of the locals can tell me more what's going on. Okay, now, for some reason, Jonathan asked me to uh, end this presentation with a couple of overseas pictures from the Ukraine, so. Yeah, so I, I, we, you know, Victor's been to 53 different countries, and we couldn't do a presentation that covered all 53, so I just asked him to cover one that was, uh, you know, been in the news recently, so here we go. Oh, hang on. Um, I stick again, just to say, there we go. Okay, this is... This is a picture of a standard uh, Soviet Railways S, uh, SU locomotive. They built hundreds and hundreds of these, maybe maybe thousands. I, I don't know the exact count, but it was a standard engine from the 1930s on in the Soviet Union. Um, this one is at Matarov in Ukraine, southern Ukraine. Uh, train was going that day from ivano Frankovsk to uh, Rakhov on the Romanian border. And uh, this was in 1992, in December. Yep, lovely shot. Uh, the big engines they had were these uh, P36 484s. They had 250 of those built in the 50s, and it was standard mainline passenger engine, uh, kind of light northern. They had light axle loading, kind of like the Canadian National Northerns. Uh, they could go on a lot of lines. And uh, here's a pair of them on a excursion train that we organized one time in a place called Krasnoselka in the Ukraine, in west of Kiev. What's the difference between the one that's blue and green? Are they just, they paint different ones in different schemes or? Different paint, that's all. You can oh. see the star on the front and uh, I think. Oh, yeah. The head of somebody, I think is Lenin. <laughs> oh, probably could be, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. okay, last picture. Uh, this is a place called Lenkovici, where it climbs up out of the Dinesta River Valley. And uh, needless to say, uh, this is from 94. Weather got pretty crummy, so you kind of had to resort to your own, bringing your own sunshine along, which I did here. But uh, the picture has some atmosphere to it. It was worth taking. 
anyway, uh, you say I've taken photographs in 53 countries. I've actually been in 80 countries, but a lot of that was business or, or non-railroad stuff. Um, but yeah, Ukraine was a pretty nice place. Uh, it's really a shame what's going on there today. Uh, nice people, nice country. Food was fine. Uh, Victor, what was the what's the gauge in Ukraine? Russian what's gauge, uh, which uh, I've seen. Uh, I always thought it was five foot, but so, someone was telling me it was uh, uh, four foot ten and a half or something. Uh, somebody will have to check that out. I always I always assumed Russian gauge was five foot, same as Spain. I don't know, but at this point, uh, Robert chimed in. And Robert, uh, you've been monitoring the chat. Uh, do we have any questions for Victor that have come sure. up? We have a couple came in, and uh, I just this was early on, uh, and it was a hello to him uh, from. Let me find it here. Uh, Richard Dawson said hello. I look forward to seeing Victor's photos. Has been a New York Central and Penn Central employee himself. Particularly enjoy seeing his photos of the Hell Great Bridge recently. And then Frank Shear said, good evening. I remember you from the U.S. Uh, Railway Association, 1978 to 1982. And best wishes from Frank Shear and his well, contact. I, I, you got the years wrong. The U.S. Railway Association was formed in 1973. I was there from 74 through 77. Okay. Uh, well, his so contact information is in there in case you, and he's in Boyce, uh, of Virginia. Uh -huh. uh, and then one of the questions is uh, Richard Dawson also asked that one of your your one cloud shot is great and asked what type of filters you use for your black and white film. None. None. None? No filters. Wow. It's, a, it's all exposure. Uh, the secret is exposure. Get exposing right. Uh, Steve Noble uh, wanted to know, and I know things were a lot different that that many decades ago. But did you ever receive any permission to be on the railroad property before taking photos back in the day? Well, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, when I went overseas, for sure. Okay, I used to write ahead, and uh, uh, you still had trouble. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I'm, I'm England. I remember I used to write to the general manager and. and you got permission for it. I, I never had any problem getting permission. Uh, but the problem was sometimes uh, if you ran into the police, you had a little problem anyway. Particularly, I was in South Africa in 1966 uh, with Harold Edmondson and Bob Kaflish. And that was the year that Hendrik Verfoot, who was the father of apartheid, was assassinated. And they thought the revolution was starting. So we had all kinds of interesting experiences that year with the South African police, even though we had a letter from the general manager. Um, that, that particular letter was good because uh, I'd gone over there in 65 and got permission. And the general manager uh, said, come see me. Uh, so, of course, I did. And uh, went back the next year, gave him some photographs. He said, well, what can I do to make your trip this year more successful? I said, what we need is a smoke order. So he had his secretary dictate out a letter to all concerned uh, to please make smoke upon demand. And this raised some eyebrows out in the line when some fireman or an engine driver saw the general manager's signature. Everybody knew that signature. And uh, we got the smoke. Uh, I still have that in my files. But yeah, overseas, you needed permission. In this country, uh, sometimes it was pretty free and easy back when. Everybody remembers when nobody bothered you too much. But in recent years, of course, I just don't go in yards, terminals anymore. You just don't want to go around with that stuff. Um, uh, yeah, sometimes I'd get permission, but uh, not not too often. Uh, just didn't bother. I just I just kept my nose clean and stayed away from sensitive places. And of course, I never wanted to be doing anything stupid. Uh, you know, I'm a professional railroader, and I know the safety rules, and, and I know how to deal with it. Uh, Frank uh, also went in to say that uh, you were a consultant for the rail use case and worked with John Click and Howard Wilchins with USRA. Uh, and he said you were correct that the he was in the Conrail setup a year prior to his arrival in 1978. Yeah, well, the Conrail was formed in 76. So by that time, USRA existed uh, to admit after 1976, April 1st, when Conrail was formed. USRA was running some other programs, given federal money. You know, some went to the Rock Island, I remember, and with Katie. Uh, and there were a bunch of other things they were doing. I had left the company by then. Uh, after Conrail was formed, I, I left within six months. Uh, I wanted to go to work for Conrail, but I didn't want to move to Philadelphia. 
So that didn't work out. So I went consulting and uh, ended up working for just about everybody in the United States and around the world. Uh, we have a note here from uh, Todd uh, Halamka. Hopefully I'm uh, pronouncing that right. Extraordinary work, Victor, really beautifully composed and developed. Uh, he said, you taught me long ago that all you need is one shot given any scene. And even though he's still failing, but taking multiple, but far less than he used to. And he wants to thank you for your amazing art, amazing artistry. And then uh, Frank Shear just uh, wanted to uh, illustrate um, the uh, the great views from the past today. Uh, and then other other thank yous are coming in from Frank uh, uh, Buckholtz, uh, Valerie Randall. So take the time to take a peek at those um, and uh, really, really appreciative of your work. If you have any other questions for Victor, please uh, type them in the chat now. Uh, we've had him captive here for almost two hours. So we want to be cognizant of his time and everybody else's as well. So yeah, if we don't hear any more questions in the next minute, we're going to uh, move to the credits and wrap up the program and conclude the presentation. And then maybe we'll hang around for a few minutes afterwards if someone wants to say hi to Victor. So anything more, Robert? Are we ready for the nope, credits? I think we're good to go. So we okay, can uh, wrap we it up. Thank you. So Victor Hand, of course, uh, me, Jonathan Fisher is your host, Robert Scott doing the Q&A. And the photos from today's uh, presentation are from the Center for Railroad Photography and Art Collection at Madison, Wisconsin. We thank our sponsoring organizations, the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive, Cascade Rail Foundation, and of course, all of the good offices of the Center for Railroad Art and Photography, Railroad Photography and Art in Madison, Wisconsin. And funding for this program comes from For Culture, a cultural funding agency for King County, Washington, and from viewers like us. Thank you for registering and attending our program. If you have a friend or you want to know more about PNRA or some of our future programs, please contact me. And you can contact me at the email address below, info at pnraarchive.org. So that is the end of our program. I'm going to stop the share. And uh, everybody is free to go. But if somebody would like to say hi to Victor, raise your hand. Robert will call on you. And uh, we've got a, a couple of minutes to, uh, for everybody. If anybody wants to say hi to, to Victor, uh, go ahead. Frank Shear, your hand is up. Say something. Oh, hi, Victor. I just uh, wanted to clarify. There was a couple of times where you came back to USRA as a consultant. And uh, they were asking you questions about, uh, you know, what lines were... Uh, in the Erie Lackawanna, in the Lehigh Valley, and so on like that. We were preparing some, some drawings that we were going to give to the special judges, the three judges, uh, of uh, what the railroad routes were so they could visualize it in their office for the rail use case. So that's when I saw you, you know, you were coming back on in. And uh, just nice to see you years later. And I've seen some of your photographs before and certainly uh, enjoyed all of them. I'm glad you like him. Uh, that work at USRA um, was probably the high point of my career. I, I did uh, a lot of the operations planning, putting the Conrail system together. And then I ran the conveyance process uh, where all the particular pieces of real estate had to be conveyed. And uh, it was pretty exciting work. Uh, and I think probably the most valuable thing I've done, haven't done much useful since. But that, that was good work at USRA and uh, it was a good organization. I had some really smart people there. Indeed. Okay. Well, thanks again for your presentation tonight. Yep. Thank you, Frank. Now, Shane Hopper, you have your hand up so you can put your hand down, turn your camera on and, and say hi. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. Um, that Victor is talking about, uh, to a friend of mine, Bob Gallegos, tonight, and he is telling me what a noted photographer you are. And uh, I just want to say without people like yourself and specifically from the photos that I've seen, I think you're a huge motivation for, for photographers and modelers. Um, I specifically really enjoy modeling the unique lash-ups of locomotives that the Milwaukee Road had up in the Pacific Northwest. And just, you know, the uniqueness of the area, the beauty and everything. Um, I just want to say thank you for, you know, taking the time to share with us tonight and for all the time and hard work. And I'm sure the crazy adventures you had back in the day um, going to do all that stuff. So just thank you so much again for the inspiration and just awesome absolutely awesome thank you guys all for putting this on this is part of what makes the hobby special and i really hope i get to see more well thank you sean very much victor 
Yeah, thanks very much for your compliment. Uh, I should mention uh, there is a lot more stuff online. Uh, Scott Lothis of the Center for Rebel Photography and Art has put, I think, 11 portfolios together of my stuff, uh, some in the United States and some overseas. And if you go to their website, you can find that stuff and look at it. Of course, you won't have me, you won't have me talking about it, but at least you'll be able to see the photographs. If you look at the chat, I put in the links for the PNRA, for the CRPA, and for the Virtual Rail Fan Chehalis link. Uh, so you can take a peek at that. Great. And uh, Jeffrey so Moffitt, you have your, Moffitt, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Jeffrey. I think you're on mute, Jeffrey. You need to unmute. Okay, so Jeffrey, if you could unmute, you have your hand up, and uh, I don't see any more comments after this. Oh, Todd, okay. Jeffrey? Let me see if I can get the, I am asked to unmute. You see if you can help him unmute in yeah, the meantime. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I just wanted to oh. thank Victor again and everyone that was involved in putting this forward, echoing everyone's uh, sentiment, and hope to see you in Lake Forest, Victor. I'll be there. Oh, okay. I finally figured out how to hide on mute the phone. There you go, Jeffrey. Go ahead, please. Great work there, Mr. Hand. Thank you for that presentation. Glad you like it. Okay. Uh, I met you and Don Phillips a couple of years ago on that bridge east of Roanoke. For yeah, Blue Ridge. I remember. The 611. Okay. Well, fantastic. Yeah, we, yep. you know, Victor's out on trackside often enough, even people like me bump into it once in a while. So that's good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And Richard Dawson, you had your hand up. Yeah, I did. So I don't know whether I was successfully able to unmute or not. You're unmuted, so keep going. All right. Yeah, great. So thanks, Victor. They're great photographs. I really enjoy them, particularly that you continue to work with uh, black and white, which is really great. Uh, I had a speed graphic for a while, so I understand the extra effort that it takes to use as compared to a 35 millimeter camera, either film or digital. So I uh, appreciate the effort you've put in over the years and uh, really enjoy your photographs. Glad you like them. Yep. Thank you, Richard, for your comments. So do I hear any more comments from anybody? I'm, I'm looking around the room here, seeing if anybody's got anything more to add. No, I, I think I think we're good from our standpoint and look okay. for more programs like this in the future, too. If everyone is enjoying this, we have some new people from uh, the Midwest and the East Coast. Uh, look forward to some additional uh, content from the group here. Fantastic. And thank you, Robert, for your assistance with the chat. And Victor, of course, brilliant as ever, a very entertaining program. And at this point, I'm going to say to everybody, thank you very much for being here and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you all and hope to see you next time. Victor, you were magnificent. You were Thank just, you. just great. All right, everybody. Bye for now. And we'll see you again in the not too distant future.